All right, so welcome everyone to the Right Bryce podcast. Quasi Millington here, and tell me if I'm saying your full name correctly. I'm here with Jessica Santanato. Perfect. Okay. All Got right. Uh, so I just read a bit of a bio here, but I just want you to get right into your story. So Jessica Santanato is an inspirational speaker who shares the message of forgiveness and finding the gift in painful experiences. In her latest memoir, Flip the Script, she shares her journey of living a criminal lifestyle, assault, attempted suicide, and domestic violence before the age of 30 to her rise in conscious leadership and humanitarian work by the age of 35. Recognized for her leadership abilities, she was one of three people chosen by an American personal development company to help more than a thousand entrepreneurs from all across from across all continents, achieve success through the power of vivid story sharing and communication. Uh, She's been featured in media such as CBC Radio, Cosmopolitan Magazine, Rogers TV, various podcasts, and has given talks at TEDx, Humber College, Mississauga City Hall, Inner City Schools, and at an event for international peace activist slash conscious hip hop artist, Emmanuel Jai. Uh, You can go, I think it's Jai or Jal, I hope. Joel. Okay. Uh, so I apologize for getting the name wrong, but all I want to do uh, is talk to you about everything you've been through. And this is a podcast about resilience. So uh, your story is that. So just take me back and take our listeners back to where you were and what you've gone through uh, because it's remarkable. Sure. Yeah. So I'm, I'm originally from Edmonton and, you know, growing up in the eighties, uh, I like to provide kind of a context, you know, things are different now than they were back then. Um, so I grew up in a really, really good home. And uh, again, I say this because some, sometimes people hear my story and they're like, oh, you must come from a broken home or abuse or drugs. And I'm like, no, actually, I came from a very, very good home. Like, actually, my parents are still together, you know, married for over 40 years now. And, you know, growing up in Edmonton, I felt like you know, I never really fit in. It was a predominantly white area. I'm visible minority. So I experienced racism there, um, bullying, called names, all that stuff. So I never really found a place where I fit in. And, you know, even though I came from a good home, you know, I, I was bored, you know, teenage years, I was bored. I was just, just wanted to do something different. How I got into, you know, getting involved or getting attracted to people who were involved with gangs, I don't know exactly, you know, where that came from, but I think it's fascinating in hindsight where I never liked to read books as a child, but the only ones that I would read were either about true crime or ghost stories. So I don't know if this is like a past life thing or like what, but I was always intrigued by true crime. That was one of the things. So you know, for me, um, you know, Edmonton, it wasn't as big as it is now. And it, everyone pretty much, it seemed like knew each other. So, you know, I remember being 15 years old and when I was 15, it was the first time that I had left home and it was the first time that I had my first boyfriend and that boyfriend, it was somebody who turned out to be in house arrest for one of the city's most well-known murders at the time. And it didn't scare me at the time. It just intrigued me. You know, there was a, an online chat at the time called Asian Avenue. It was like a really popular thing. Okay. <laughs> a bunch of Asians from North America jump on and like, hey, I'm from North York. Hey, I'm from Edmonton. Hey, I'm from it. So we would, a bunch of us would congregate on there. And two of my friends, there are these twin girls from Hong Kong. They said, hey, I, th- I think there's this guy, you know, online that you should meet. Okay. And, you know, so I started to write to him and then lo and behold, found out he was in house arrest again I was intrigued so we set up he thought it was a joke he, when I called him and that was like the dial-up days remember like the dial-up oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I would tell my mom like mom I gotta I forgot what I told her with some excuse I basically kicked her out of the office so she left and then I would like dial dial up on there and get online so he thought it was a joke so when I actually called him he's like yeah Steven stop playing around like I know it's you and I'm like hi Uh (laughs) he's like oh my gosh it's actually a girl so you know we connected and he found a way to come pick me up I went over to his place so we started a relationship so like I said he was my first boyfriend um it was the first time that I got involved with drugs at the time he introduced me to um some softer stuff 
and, um, you know, first time that I had sex. So there was a lot that happened at 15 Mm. and, you know, that was the first half of grade 10 for me. And, you know, my mom, she, you know, we think we're slicker than our parents, but our parents know stuff. So my dad, he would hide a tape recorder in his room and he would tape record my calls. Uh And I didn't know this, but one day I found it and I was so mad and I like cried and like ran out. I was so angry. And, um, my mom, she talked to the high school liaison officer to try to, you know, knock some sense into me. And it was funny in hindsight, because he was like the cute cop and like girls would make some excuse to go like (laughs) have an appointment with him. Yeah. And talk to him. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like annoyed that he would wanted to talk to me. Um, so he would pull me in and he would talk to me and he's like, you know, uh, I, apparently you're with this guy um and he would try to scare me like he would try to say things like like did you know that if you have a child with this this guy that the criminal um dna like he was trying to like tell me all this stuff right and so my mom she eventually sent me to vancouver for the second part of grade 10 because she said so if you had a kid with him, you'd have a criminal child, I criminal guess. Criminal child. Okay, I, did, I didn't get that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You passed out a criminal gene. Okay. Exactly. And I was like, oh, okay. But, you know, being 15, whatever, like, okay. So I went to Vancouver for the second half of grade 10. And my mom had her sisters there my, and cousins. So she said, until you can prove to be a good girl again, you have to stay in Vancouver. So I went to Vancouver. I was good, you know, quote unquote, good, good. I, you know, found new friends, all that stuff. And then I told my mom, I said, please, can I come back for grade 11, finish high school with my other friends? And she said, okay, I came back by the time I came back at 16. Um, it wasn't long at all before I started connecting with guys, uh, not my, my boyfriend at, when I was 15, but other guys who were involved with gang, the gang as well. So we started to hang out, you know, more and more. And when I was 16, um, there was one of, one of the guys, he was a gang leader and he brought me over to a place, um, one time and that there was one night there that I was gang raped. Um, and that was by 13 guys. Um, and at the time, and you're 16 at the time, 16. And I remember I didn't cry, but I remember being really scared because it was one of those, like, I remember the room was so dark and I had to stand on my tippy toes to even see outside. And it was like one guy after the next would come into the room, come into the room. And because I couldn't focus after that, I wasn't, you would think I'd be more traumatized maybe, but I remember going back to school and I had this really great math teacher that I loved, Mr. Hatch. And I told him what happened because I was basically trying to say, look, if I can't concentrate in class, it's because of this. And I remember he sat down with me in the hallway and his jaw literally dropped, dropped open. Like he, and based on his reaction, I was thinking like, oh, is it that big of a deal? Like, I didn't know it was that bad, you know? So he said, I think I should put you in touch with the high school liaison officer here. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, here we go again with these high school liaison officers, right? So were you like traumatized? I guess mentally you kind of didn't really put together how bad it was, what happened? Or I didn't, it, it wasn't so bad for me as maybe other people would think it would have been, but it was still like, I still went through some kind of mental processing of like, um, I'm not saying it wasn't traumatizing, I, I just, for me, from what I recall, it wasn't as traumatizing as others may have thought okay. um, or would think at the time. Maybe it's the way you, you, you processed it. And I just thought that people hearing it would be like, how can you not be traumatized by being, you know, gang raped and in, in such a manner and by so many people, right? So yeah. I guess it's just, it's crazy that I'm hearing yeah. the story, but I understand when people go through trauma, sometimes the way they process it is totally different exactly exactly and even like after when you hear about the other things that I've been through in life it's just I don't know it's kind of one of those it happened yeah, I know this is just a start. I'm just <laughs> I, I just forgot about that part of the story when we last talked yeah so that happened and I you know got in touch with the the high school liaison officer I'm like great okay yeah okay whatever I'll do this 
just to get through the motions of it. And one day I remember he called me into his office and there was the gang unit sitting there. And it was the first time I was introduced to them, but there were these two guys that everybody in the gang knew who they were, these two guys. And um, I remember they had a huge, huge book of mug shots in there. And they asked me to tell them all the guys that I knew. And I told, I pointed out a few just to kind of get them off my back. But when I talked to the guys about it, they're like, oh my gosh, like they came to your school to come talk to you. So when I was seven, so I continued to hang out with these guys and, um, you know, it was really rough back home because like I had a really close relationship with my mom and, um, it hurt to see her hurt, but I was so strong headed and just wanted to keep following in this lifestyle. And so then when I was 17, um, I remember there was just one day I got, I got fed up. I was done. Didn't want to be at home. I called one of the guys. I said, can you come pick me up or send a car to come get me? And they said, sure. So I took a luggage, packed it with just my basics. And it was the middle of winter. This is January of, um, I think it's yeah, 99. And I, you know, Edmonton dead cold, crazy cold went down the stairs as soon as I saw the car. Cause my parents have the alarm system on and that was it. Like I left. So they brought me back to this apartment and is what it was one of the gang leaders that I knew he's one the guy that instigated the gang rape actually. And then sitting there on the floor was a guy who later became my boyfriend and then fiance and then husband. But I remember sitting, I see him sitting there and I was like, Oh, and he said hi to me, but he was one of the nicer guys. I'm like, Oh, he was actually kind of like kind one of the nicer gang members. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I, so I went to the room, ended up having sex with the, the first guy. And then the guy sitting on the floor who I later became, you know, husband, wife, um, hu- yeah, husband, wife with, um, he came in after. So that's how our relationship started, had sex, I think twice. And then he like at that time, like I just never questioned anything. Right. You know, I was too afraid to say like, where are we going? What are we doing? And he said, come on, let's go. So it was him, the other guy and a third guy. We jumped in the car. I didn't question where we were going. Turned out to be later a house where they were, you know, wrapping drugs and all that stuff. They showed me how to, you know, do what they were doing. And at the end, um, my, uh, well, him at the time who came, later became my, my um, husband, D we call him. Um, he joked with me. He's like, come on, I'm going to, I'm going to kidnap you. Uh, like he put me, he goes, come out with me to the car. I go to the car and he goes, I joked with the other guy that I'm going to kidnap you. And I kind of had this nervous laugh like, Oh, okay. You know, like, again, like I'm not going to question anything, but I'll go with him. So he ended up taking me to his apartment and he wanted me to stay with him. And it was kind of far from my school. And he's like, how much money do you have on you? And I said, I just have this $50 that my mom gave me. And he goes, give it to me. I said, no, my mom gave it to me, but he demanded I give it to him. So I gave it to him and I was crying. I missed class. And it was, it's funny because even though as much as I want to be a part of that lifestyle, I still wanted my like perfect attendance. Like I still want to go to school. I want to have a foot in both worlds, if you would. And yeah, it's kind of wild. I I have to remind people that this is, you're what, 17 at the time? And you've been going through this since you were 14, 15. Yeah. Um, I can't imagine that kind of childhood, what that does to your mind. But I mean, I guess you can get into that after, but yeah, this is a crazy experience by the age of 17, one of the craziest I've heard. Um, but yes, yeah, so you're with him. Go ahead. Yeah, I was with him in the 17. And then I was in tears because I'm like, that's my, my mom gave it to me, number one. And that was the money I had. And then he so he ended up giving me some money so I can get to, to school. And he drove me and he goes when the day that he drove me, he goes, I said, oh, just, you know, pull up by that door. And I, I keep in mind, I didn't know he was a gang leader at this time. So I like I had no idea. So I said, just pull up to this door. I'll, I'll get out here. He goes, no, I can't go there, but I'm going to come go around the corner. I'll leave you here. I'm like, OK, so. I didn't find out his status until later on. It didn't take that long. Um, But all these guys would find out and they're like, oh, you're with that guy. Oh, you're with that guy. Oh, did you know who he is? I'm like, no. Mm -hmm. So they would tell me stories. And and then he even said to me one day, he goes, do you know who I am? And I said, no, I don't. Um, And so him and I continued and the high school principal found out that I was with him through the, the gang unit and the police liaison officer 
And he pulled me into his office one day and he was like the principal. And he said, um, look, I know you're with this guy. And he basically told me, if you don't stop seeing him, I'm going to have to have you suspended. Like, you can't come here. I was like, okay, well, I'll sus suspend me then. He's like, well, I'm not saying I want to, but if you're going to continue with him, because I can't have the other students in jeopardy, I'm like, all right, well, I'm done. So I walked out and I finished, ended up finishing again. I was determined to get my high school oh, education. That doesn't surprise me that you did that at all. I mean, yeah, you're, you had already shown that I'm going to do what I'm going to do. So exactly. I knew that what that principal threat wasn't going to do anything. But uh, yeah, yeah, and then you know, up, so. Okay. It was funny because I would call places on my own for night school to finish high school. Right. And my mom told me this, like just a year ago, she told me that she was so afraid for my life. She didn't know where I was, but she found out I was finishing high school at nighttime somewhere and she would call and, and then the lady would say, well, sorry, it's private confidential, confidential information. I can't tell you if she showed up and she's like, you know, my mom called in tears and the lady to ended up telling her like, okay, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but yeah, she did show up for class today. So at least it gave my mom some relief that I was alive. Cause my mom, and again, this is very recently that my mom would say she would open the newspaper and she would expect to see me like dead, you know, because that was a time when Edmonton's gang violence was the highest it had ever been. This was late night it was 99 2000 so it seemed like almost daily it seemed like it was but probably wasn't daily but there was always news of gangs constantly and people being murdered and this and that and people getting arrested so this was at the height of all of that and I don't know if you recall this because I know you weren't in Edmonton but um, in Edmonton they built a huge courthouse um, for the gang members and the whole like um, all of the, the trials that were supposed to happen, which never ended up really happening. Um, so a bunch of these guys were arrested and um, I was with D for two weeks and we had no idea that he was on a Canada wide warrant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so two weeks after being with him, we go to a storage unit where he has a unit under my name and all of a sudden the tactical unit is like everywhere. We come out, there's guns pointed, um, like not just regular handguns, right? Like, yeah, yeah, heavy duty stuff. <laughs> yeah. So there's like half of the team on me and the others are running after him up the ramp. And I'm like, again, I'm 17, like, oh my gosh. And I was just more annoyed than anything. Cause I was just like, I was like, fuck. I was like, could you just leave us alone? Like, let him do his thing. Yeah. And they were like, get out of the car, turn around, walk backwards with your hands behind your back. So I'm like, ah, this is so annoying. So I get out of the car. They of arrest. The piece of you is not taking it totally seriously. It's just like, okay, police get off my back. Type exactly. Thing. Like you're yeah. annoying, whatever. Right. So they go get him. They arrest him. He's on the six o'clock news. And um, they bring me down to the station, question me, all this stuff, all the whole thing of like, if you don't good, you know, this the good cop, bad cop thing and whatever. I was a minor. I was let go at the end of the day. And um, that night, I remember seeing him on the news. He was in remand. Um, it ended up being for several years, actually, that he stayed in in remand. And um so then he asked me one day, he's like, do you want to be my girlfriend? And I was like, uh, sure. So I was like, what do I have to lose? I need him because I, I can't go back to my parents. I need to save face. He, he needs somebody to take care of his stuff, whatever it works. Why not? So that's how our relationship started. And I should actually say that, um, the first time ever someone had ever put his ha their hands on me was him. And that was within the two weeks that we were together, he took it like I had attitude or something. When I asked, he asked me to go get coffee in a newspaper from across the street. So he put his hand on my neck and he pushed me violently into the, in, like towards the wall. And he stopped just short of like, before my head would go into the wall. And I remember being so shooken up by that. And I was crying. And um, he's like, he said something like, don't ever, don't ever say no, or don't ever give me attitude again or something. So that was the first time. That was the first sign. Were you married yet? Or where no, were you? In no. So you're, I, how old were you when that happened? I was 17. And that was within the first two weeks that we had met. 
Okay. So, because I was staying at his apartment now, right? And I knew he was different from the other guys because the other guys usually it was like, you know, kind of bummy ap- apartments and whatever. But this guy had like high end stuff and it was only his place and clean. So, um, you know, we continued our relationship with like that. He was uh, locked up and then I would stay outside and help him do certain things and help him whatever, like that, that went on. And then I, you mean he was in jail while you were on the outside? Yes. Whatever he wanted you to do. Yeah. And then the, the conditions in remand got so bad. Um, a lot of the guys couldn't take it. And these were like tough and he was not somebody like he could take a lot. Right. So for him to say he couldn't take it anymore, I knew that the conditions were really serious. Um, I think there was like a class action suit against uh, the government for that. Um, And now Edmonton has a new remand center. But at the time he said, he's like, you know what? I think I'm just going to take the plea instead of waiting here because we don't know how much longer this is going to be. Right. That was 99 by 2001, whatever. He was still sitting there, no trial, nothing. So he took the plea. He was the first person. And, um, when he went to the pen, um, again, we continued our relationship. I got married to him when I was 18, he was seven years older than me and we conceived our first child in prison. So it was like, I remember going to my mom cause I had to go from Edmonton to Drumheller where he was. And I would take the Greyhound, but I stopped and I had to make a stop in Edmonton first, um, at my mom's place. And she, I was like, so I'm getting married. She was like, what could she say? Like, she's like, Jess, you're going to do it anyways. Right. No matter what I say. So I ended up going down, getting married, all that stuff. Um, He got out just before our firstborn was born. So he was, um, so he was first locked up in 99 and then he got out in 2002. And there was a bit of a back and forth thing where he was, you know, he came out and then he went back in for a little bit, but we ended up having three kids together um verbally abusive throughout and it was one of those things where you know when things were great they were amazing and when when things were really bad they were like really really bad Mm. and I remember when I was pregnant with my son he hit me with a brush and um yeah that was like that was really shocking as well for me and when my son was born um he was still in the carrier and my daughter was two at the time and he had threatened to kill me. And I remember thinking like I had it, like that was it. And I never wanted to ever lie to him or for him, you know, and that, you know, being in that lifestyle, you don't go to the police or anything. Right. But something inside was like, just like, how are you going to get out of this? You need to get out. So I told him I was going to the shopping mall with the kids But instead, what I did is I went to headquarters, to police headquarters, and I thought, this is my chance to get out of this relationship. So I went up into that. I just want to ask what made you decide that was the time? Because if someone's listening, they might think, okay, your whole life, you've been going through things that probably would have said to other people, or maybe made have said to other people, okay, I don't think I want to be a part of this life. But you had gone through a lot before you finally reached your breaking point. Why do you think it took you that long and what brought you to that point? I think it's a number of things like part maturity, you know, as years go on, like, it's like, come on, like I was getting that lifestyle. Number one is exhausting. So to keep even like as the wife, right. Like there were still things I had to always constantly be on the lookout for. Um, I was looking underneath the car for bombs before I would go in and I was constantly having to look in the rear view mirror at who would be following us, whether it was his enemies, whether it was police, whatever, it was very, very stressful. So I think it was part maturity of just like, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, I was also a mother, you know? Um, and then I think also just having the opportunity, like I saw an opening, to to get out because I told myself for so long I said I'll never be free until he dies like I told myself that for so long before that point so I remember when I went up you know the shopping mall was just beside headquarters and I I walked up the stairs and there was a female officer sitting at the desk I told her you know I was in tears I told her what happened I said my husband had threatened to kill me and she goes 
she basically said to me, she goes, do you have family in the city? And I was like, um, like in reality, I had a lot of family, but I said, yeah, I have an uncle. And she goes, okay. She slides me the phone and she goes, if you don't call him right now and tell him what happened, I'm going to have your kids taken away from you. That's an odd response to, to that's help, what, help me. <laughs> yeah. That's what a police officer said to me at the front desk. And on top of that, I'm thinking, and a female officer, like for yeah. me, it was like a relief, like, oh my gosh, like maybe there's some kind of safety because it's like, there's a woman I can confide. That was the answer that I got. And she said, she goes, I'm not a counselor. You have girlfriends for that. I'm telling you. I can't you, believe a, a, a cop said that to you at, at, at all, but a female cop is. is I was I so find. shocked. I couldn't believe I was hearing this from a police officer. I thought, wow. I remember thinking if the police can't help me, nobody can help me. I couldn't believe that I was hearing those words. And so obviously I didn't want my kids taken away from me. So I called my uncle, you know, then and there, I had to make an excuse to my husband saying like, Oh, I just needed some time out. I'm just going to stay with my uncle tonight, whatever. So he didn't flip out. He never found out. I went to the police, you know, and sometimes I think back at that moment because I feel like, you know, there could have been, and there are many women who are in those kind of circumstances where you try to get out and then he finds out or, or who knows, like other women or men could have been met with the same kind of officer that day that said something similar. I don't know. Like I, I I don't believe in luck. Um, I believe in divine intervention, whatever you want to call it. Like I, I was very blessed that nothing worse happened, you know, cause that could have led to something really bad. If in my case, if he had found out. So, um, that was the first time that I tried to get help, went back to the marriage. I thought, okay, well I'm staying. Um, then we had our third kid together and then we moved out. Um, so that was, that was then in Vancouver and then we moved out to Toronto and, um, you know, I was working as a personal caregiver at the time. So twice a week I would be um, helping this lady who had Alzheimer's and who had to stay at her house two nights out of the week. So my husband would stay home with the kids. And one day he called me and he, he said one of the girls was bleeding and deep down, I didn't think he would hurt the kids, but I just didn't know. It's like maternal instinct kicked in. So I jumped in the car, told my employer, which was her son, the woman's son. I said, I, I got to go. I'll be back. Sped home. And when I got to the door, he opened the door and he, as long as I knew him, he had this look in his eyes. It was almost like a shade of evil came over and I, there was nothing I could say or do that would ever could ever turn him around. So when I saw that, I was like, Oh, like my heart dropped to my stomach. Like something bad's about to happen. Something's bad. It's going to happen. And in the corner of my eye, cause he had the door, I wasn't in the house yet. I saw an empty bottle of liquor on the table and he never drunk. So I was like, okay, things are, something's like not good at all and he was like come inside and he goes the girls are okay so at that point um he was basically like the abuse before I go on the abuse had gotten so bad at th that point like the verbal abuse and I remember going to work that became my relief you know because I got to get away from all that there was so much of the name calling belittling whatever you know and a typical abuser abusey relationship he would apologize I would accept it, whatever, back and forth, back and forth. So I was speaking to somebody at my workplace about it, who was another guy. And I told him because he found emails. So he said, he told me he found emails. He showed me the computer and he was, listen, he's like, let's just get everything out on the table. You say what you need to say, because there's things that I need to say too. And remember, I, I always had fear. Like I didn't want to trigger him in any way. And I thought, I took a deep breath. I remember thinking like, all right, this is the time to just tell him. Like, I feel like, okay, he's giving me the opening to just provide a safe space. I'm going to tell him that there's this other person I'm speaking to. And when I told him that, that's when he punched me in the face. And I was wearing glasses at the time. He punched me in the face. And when one of the glasses lenses popped out and I fell backwards onto this, we had this beautiful white Italian sofa and he got on top of me and he choked me. Um, he put his hands around my neck 
And he looked at me and he told me, he said, I'll kill you. He, he actually said, I'll kill you. He said, I kill people like you, whatever that meant. And I remember freaking out the first time that he put his hands on me. Cause I, when I was losing consciousness, I had three thoughts at the time. And this happened in like microseconds. And it was one, my parents won't find, will find my body here. Two, my children won't have their mother. And three, this isn't fair. I didn't get to do everything I wanted to do. And that last thought became the catalyst for what I'm doing today. You know, this isn't fair. I didn't get to do everything I wanted to do. And I remember he, you know, I came to, he choked me out again, or I should say strangled. And then um, when I came to, you know, the room was spinning, he broke a chair over me. And then he disappeared. And I was kind of like in shock, right from everything. But then he also all of a sudden disappeared. Where did he go? And then when I was kind of like standing up trying to get my balance, he came from around the foyer corner. And what I don't know when he placed it there, but there was like an eight inch stainless steel kitchen knife. And I remember he picked it up. And by now it must have been like 3am. So the kids, all three kids were sleeping upstairs. And it was crazy because I'm like the front door is right there. It's like, I could make a bolt for it, but as a mother, I didn't want to leave my children. And so I was like, all right, I got to face this. And so much fear sunk in when I saw him pick up that knife, because I thought, wow, this is the last scene I'm going to see before I die. Like, this is it. Like kids don't even know, like their mother's dead, you know? So he, you know, he was six, one, 270 pounds. Like people thought he was a football player. There was no way I was going to even try to fight him. And I remember he came up to me, I'm five, three. He came up to me. He walked ever so slowly. I don't think he even blinked. And he took the, he took the knife and he raised it right above my head. And I remember like apologizing as much as I could, even though I felt like I did nothing wrong. I was just like, whatever I could to get him to calm down. And I squeezed my eyes so tight. And I remember just praying at that moment. I said, God, I hope this doesn't hurt too much. And I remember him taking the first stab at the top of my head. And he, it was like a really quick in and out motion at the top of my scalp. And you know, when you go to the dentist, like you get the freezing, you can feel the motion, but you can't feel the pain. It was like that. So like all of the adrenaline, like you don't feel it. Right. It's like when I hear people, when they're shot, you don't feel the pain, like whatever. So same thing. So I didn't actually didn't know the extent of my injuries. So he did that, um, you know, and then before I knew it, like, again, he had stopped and he had left and I knew that there was a gun in the house. So I didn't know if he went to go get it to finish me off or to go kill himself. Those are my two options that I was thinking about that was going to happen. So the minute I heard, I heard the second really that I heard him take, cause we had two family cars. The second I heard him leave, that's when I was like, all right, like, let's go like fight or flight. Let's go. So I quickly saw myself in the mirror, the sliding mirror and saw the injuries that I had. And I remember crunching down on my teeth enamel. Cause it like, you know, when he hit, I guess when he broke the chair over me, and I would go like this and like chunks of hair would fall out and blood and everything. And I ran upstairs, grabbed the kids. Like I said, mommy's hurt. We got to go grab toys, grab blankets. I threw them into the SUV and that was you did it. All this after being stabbed. And yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. And I left Yeah, after being stabbed and like punched in the face and chair broken. I don't know how, just whatever, you just do it, right? And I got in the car, drove, and then I, you know, had the memories of Vancouver. I was like, I can't go to the police because they're going to take my kids away. Because now I'm thinking at the time, that's standard practice, right? So there's no way I can't, I can go to the police. I can't afford to have my kids taken away from me. So I remember going like, I'm going to go to a shopper's drug mart. I'm going to go get some bandages to bandage myself up which was ridiculous in hindsight. So I pull up to the shopper's drug mart and I was just like, Jess, you have to go to a hospital. Like, like you need to get stitched up. What are you doing? So I pulled up to the hospital. I told my kids, I felt so guilty about this, but I said, mommy needs to go get help. Just like stay ducked down. Like don't move. Don't ask, don't open the door. And they were crying. They were so young and they were in the dark. It's like 6am. And how old are your kids at this time? 
Oh gosh, at this time they were, this was 2010, 11 years ago. So um, let me do the math here. Uh, that was, oh my gosh, 11 years ago, my oldest is going to be 15. So four, so they were like four, six and eight or three, five, seven. What's before? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So they were still young, especially the youngest one. She was so yeah. afraid. Right. So I left them there for several hours while I went inside. Um, funny enough, when I went to go, you know, to, into the triage, the nurse was like, um, uh, how did you, hurt? I didn't know I had a, a defense wound on my, like a chunk of my skin was hanging off here. And I said, Oh, it was a knife accident, a kitchen accident. She goes, are you right-handed? I go, yeah. She goes, all right. What really happened? <laughs> I was like, all right. She's you know, like, you couldn't have done all that to yourself, right? Yeah, exactly. She's like, do you want to press charges? And I said, no. So the doctor came and saw me. He stitched me up and he goes, do you want to press charges? And I said, no. I was told later by some other officers that it shouldn't have even been a question. Like they should have just called, but I don't know what standard practice is. I was very fortunate that the stab wound wasn't so deep enough where I was like needed a surgery or anything like that. But I got stitched up and I remember going to my employer's place. He let me heal there. And I remember looking out at the forces, hundred acre farm um, in Caledon. And I remember just thinking like, I don't know why, but I'm still standing. And there's got to be a reason after being stabbed and beaten, I'm still here. And when I heal up, I'm going to give back to the world. And at the like, those were the words I had in my head. And at the time I was like, I have no idea how, and I'm not trying to be some hero or martyr or anything, but the thought was just like, like, like I'm still standing, like I need to do something with my life um, and help other people. And I remember also thinking in the back of my head that I remember hearing stories of many men and women who went through something similar and turned to substance abuse or even suicide to cope or just end it all. And I vowed to myself never to become like that. Like I, and I, I swear having that determination really helped me as long as, as well as having my kids at the forefront, like knowing I had them to be strong for and live for, um, you know, and then my spirituality, like my spirituality just kept expanding. And my husband told me after why he stopped after the first stab was because the rosary he was wearing, which you never wear a rosary like that, but it was decked out in diamonds. It broke. So he said that snapped him out of his rage where he was like, what the F am I doing? So I've done talks where I've like showed people that piece because if it didn't break at the time, I don't know. Like, I don't know that I'd be here speaking to you. Yeah. Yeah. So again, divine intervention. So my spirituality just kept growing and, um, I believe in angels, you know, I believe I had angels on my side that day. And, um, you know, I, he wasn't actually arrested until three months after the attack. And that was because a psychologist, she was like, you know what, like we lived together afterwards because it was just easier that way with the kids and me having to work and stuff. But I, I how did you bring yourself to go live with him again after it was so after? hard. It was so hard because when I'd be washing dishes, I would literally like jump and that I would feel like he would come, he was going to come from behind me and like take a knife and stab me like literally in the back. Like I was, it was like walking on eggshells times 10. I was so, my counselor's like, I don't know if I should like count this as PTSD or what? Like I, you know, so um, it was really tough. And when I went to one of my psychologist appointments, she was really great. She said, you know, what if you went to the police and you said like, this is what happened, but I don't want to report it right now, but this is what happened. What if I do report it? What would happen? She's like, just find out. So I was like, yeah, maybe. So one day, like, in, like, again, this was three months after the attack, I was driving and I drove past headquarters. I was like, yeah, whatever. It's like done. I'm not going. And I swear it was like something took over the steering wheel and turned my car back around. Wow. I was like, oh, okay, I guess we're going back. We're going you to have like something inside of you, like a force just moved. Yeah. 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 Cause I'd already passed it. I'm like, nope, I'm on, almost going to be at work. Turn back around. I go in female officer at the front. So I'm thinking, oh, great. Yeah, here we go again. <laughs> and uh, told her what happened. She's like, okay, hang on. I got to go talk to supervisor. I'll be right back. She comes back and she tells me, she's like, I'm sorry. Now that the ball has been dropped, 
we have to go arrest him. And I was, and then I freaked out. Cause I'm like, no, you don't know who he is. He's going to come kill me. You like, you can't do this. And you know, he, she tried to assure me that, you know, the kids won't see him being arrested, all this stuff. Anyways, they did. Um, but they sent a bunch of police to go get him. Um, they arrested him. He never thought that I was the one that called. Um, and then that's it. Like he stayed incarcerated. And so that was, the attack happened in May. He was arrested in August and by September, yeah, by September, I was going to visit him in jail. So again, this was still part of the back and forth, like abuser, abusee, like I was still in the cycle, right? Still. And then I had this like crazy experience where I was like, all right, him and I were, were talking and then we had this plan. I was going to recant my statement, say that I lied about the whole thing so that I could get him out of, out of prison, out of jail. Yeah. So it was like hindsight. It's funny. Well, but, what could have, what could have possibly been the truth if he didn't attack you though? I guess that, that would probably yeah. be the question that would come up. Um, t- before we go on, I want to just, for people that don't understand how someone could go back after all these things happen and that abuser abusing relationship. Um, why do you think, and maybe from your own experience or from talking to other people who've gone through it, why do you think it's so hard to leave someone when someone might say, Oh, you should, you have to leave him. You know, I can only speak really from my experience. Cause I know everyone's different. Um, for me, I was afraid, like, especially knowing his status, in the gang, um, knowing what he's done to other people. So there's a lot of fear, you know, when I would see grown men jump to hide from him, like it, yeah. And this is in my book too. Like he, you know, he got away with, you know, um, you know, killing people and, and, you know, like I knew that, but I couldn't tell anybody at the time. And he had these tattoos on his arm of the people that he killed. And at nighttime, when he would wrap his arms around me, it would be a reminder for me to never say no, to never make him angry, to never leave. So I had these reinforcements like in my world. So there was a lot of fear in my, my, my situation. Um, you know, there could also be like, you know, I think I'm trying to think back. Um, what do they call it? sunken cost analysis have you heard that term sunken cost no no yeah it's like people think like oh i already put 10 years into the marriage so i might as well stay oh sunken cost okay i get what you're saying yeah 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 so i think there's also part that like we're you know we we, i've never heard that term and it, it makes sense especially the 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 part of him having that gang history and if i've made other people disappear before i can make you disappear um yeah yeah, that's totally understandable why you would believe that and stay with someone for fear for your life and your kid's life, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's exactly. finally arrested and he ends up in, in prison mm-hmm. uh, and you're still going to visit him. I'm still going to visit him with the plan to say I lied about the whole thing. Okay. And, um, eventually, you know, I had my own team of lawyers and I fa- they found out one day and went down to Toronto and they they... <laughs> They would just laugh. The one guy walked out of the room. He's like, I, he's like, I love my job. And he was just, listen, you need to tell us everything. Cause if you keep going to see him, we can't keep re- representing you. And they gave me a come to Jesus talk. They, they were both husbands and fathers relatively young as well. And they, they, they were like, listen, that is not a good husband. That is not a good father, whatever they ha- wanted to say, but it was actually something about them saying it to me where another light bulb went off for me. And I I think it was because they were men that were, it didn't come across as preachy. Like they were on the younger side. And also I'm like, Oh, like, okay, maybe they're, maybe they're right. And the way they said it, I was like, you know, that became what a huge turning point for me. And my employer at the time, you know, I got, I told you, I got to heal at his place. You know, he was very well to do. He said, when you become a millionaire, you can pay me back. And he said, look, you started something, you need to finish it. So that combination, like having that support really helped because then I was like, you know what? Yeah, they're right. Like I got to This is it. I have to make the choice and only I can make the choice to like cut this off. 
And I want to say that's an important point because I have, I often have people now that will say like, my daughter's going through this or like whatever they may personally be going through something. And there's actually no advice that I, I give anymore because I know that like, it's so easy to have one, things go in one ear and out the other until the person is ready. Because when I was going through all this, I've had a lot of people say this and that and advice and, and I couldn't hear any of it because I wasn't ready myself. So it took for me to go through all of the things I did to that point to say, you know what, I'm ready. Yeah. And then That's I could hard for a parent to hear that there's nothing you can say, right? You yeah, can... There's nothing. And I told that to a mother who was in absolute tears because her teenage daughter was hanging out with gang members as well. And I said, to be honest, you, there's nothing I could tell you to, that you could say. And that hurt, but she also understood that. And so for me, like, that was it. I, he soon realized like, okay, my wife's not coming back to jail to visit me. She's not bailing me out. There's nothing happening here. So he was livid. Um, I found out after, um, went through the whole motions of having to go to court, do the victim impact statement, which I thought was the hardest thing for me at the time. Uh, my employer said, no, actually, this is like the easiest part for you. Like, like everything else is behind you now. And um, just before he got out, um, you know, the prosecutor told me, cause they were flip-flopping between attempted murder um, and I forgot what kind of assault. And the prosecutor told me, she said, Jess, I'm so sorry. If this was the States, he would be looking at life, but because it's Canada, she said, my hands are tied. And she said, basically, like, there wasn't much she could do. Um, and, you know, it was really hard going through that court process. Um, he served time. I think the rule changed, like, the two-for-one thing, I think, changed just after um, he was locked up. Explain so, what the two-for-one thing is. So whatever time that he served um, inside, even if he wasn't sentenced yet, he was credited for that. Like, so if he was technically sentenced to like six years, he only had to do like three, okay. which is like, um, you know, kind of sounds ridiculous, but whatever. So he got out um, after serving, I think it was like three and a half years. Um, and then just before he got out, the lawyer said, hey, you should know that he's about to get out, but he wants to see the kids. And I remember freaking out because I thought, you know, my life is good here. The I, my house was, I was in hiding all this stuff. My kids are good. They're ghosted in the school system. Nobody knows where we are. All of a sudden he's going to come out and they go, Oh, don't worry. We got centers where, um, you can hand off the kids, you drop them off. And then he comes, I'm like, this stuff, how is this? Like, you don't know. You don't think that he's just going to be like waiting in the parking lot or send someone else to be waiting to see where I go or what car, like, this is not going to work. So again, I turned to my faith and I remember praying a lot. I remember talking to angels and God and, and for me, you know, cause I was actually researching where to claim refugee status. Like I was looking at Australia and like, and we, different like, country just getting out of the country, out of the country. And my mom said, even like, I don't care where you go. You just go and wherever, whenever you can, you tell me where you are. And then this like moment, like hit me. It was like something from above was like, Jess, if you run now, you're going to run for the rest of your life. And I was like, Oh, yeah, like that's so true. So I put my faith in a higher power and I said, you know what? He can see the kids, but I need to speak to him first. So we did all this through the lawyers. I talked to him and something deep down just said, everything's going to be okay. So we met up in person first before he met the kids again. Um, and then he always told me, he was like, look, sweetheart, if you ever want to get the divorce, just let me know. We can go to the courthouse. I'll just fly back from Edmonton. I'll sign the papers. So um, I was dating someone new at the time and I had a tattoo on my ring finger and the new guy, he would look at the heart with our initials. And so I remember thinking, oh, this is not going to work going forward. So I told D, I said, I think I want to get the divorce. And he goes, okay, no problem. Just give me like the next couple of weekends so I can fly back from Edmonton to Toronto. That weekend he was supposed to fly back um, that was the weekend he was found dead on his dad's sofa. And that was a big shock because his stepdad called me when I was driving, I was driving in Toronto with my youngest. And he, he told me that he was found dead, like on the sofa. And, um, 
They didn't know why exactly, but it looked like a heart attack or whatever. Um, turns out they did the toxicology reports and um, the sleeping pills that he took was laced with fentanyl. And I knew he would take sleeping pills sometimes to help him sleep, okay. but um, I guess it was laced with the fentanyl enough to kill him. So, which doesn't take much as you know. So um, that's what had happened, even though 90% of his main artery is blocked. Cause he had told me that he had some like chest pain a couple of days before he died. Um, and that was really hard as well. Cause we had gone through so much and then the kids were so happy to see him. And then all of a sudden he's dead, you know, and that was actually the best communication him and I had in our whole relationship when he got out. For the sake of the kid. So yeah, it was, it's just crazy. Like I flew back to Edmonton and I thought like, no one else is going to do his funeral. I'm going to do it. And doesn't matter to me, like, you know, before he passed away, I forgave him. Like, you know, forgiveness is a big thing for me. Um, it, it never, it was never my intention to make forg forgiveness be a big thing for me or the thing. It just happened in my journey. And I knew that I had to express my forgiveness and I have zero, I had zero resentment and I still have zero resentment for what he did, meaning him, whether it was the abuse, whether him trying to kill me. So let me ask you about that. Um, sorry to interrupt you, but let me ask you about forgiveness because a lot of times people will, that don't want to forgive someone, they say, why do I have to forgive? Like why, do, and you hear that often from people who have accepted forgiveness as something that yeah. they, do, they do, but they say, yeah. no, I have to do it. I know I had to do it. Why do you feel so compelled to, to forgive? Yeah, uh, for me, it's like, because it wasn't for him, it was for me. And to carry around the burden of resentment Resentment's a very, very heavy energy, you know, and people will carry that on for years or till like the day they die and they have these grudges, like that person did this to me and that like, yeah, but the only person that that's affecting is you. And for me, I said, I don't, I'm not going to let anybody's actions take me down just because he did something, what I'm going to suffer while they go on with their merry lives. I didn't, that's the, the view that I took. Okay. So forgiveness was for me. I just, I needed to express it. Um, there was so much freedom in it. Um, when I did, he, he really saw the peace that I had. He even said to me, he's like, wow, sweetheart, like you've come so far. And I hope that one day you can help me get to where you are. So that was really powerful for me. And when he passed away, um, when I flew back to Edmonton, you know, I, I wrote his eulogy on the plane, like it was crazy. And I went there and the last thing I wanted was for these gang members to find out that he had passed away. Cause I, now I had kids at this time. Uh, sure enough, they found out. Um, but I said, I need to speak to some of you before, like, I, it's okay for you guys to show up. And one of the guys, um, that I met up with when I was 16, he had held up a gun to me for not having sex with him. Cause I said no to him. And he was one of like the higher ups as well. And so to sit with him in the Starbucks and express my forgiveness, um, again, like it was a really, really freeing experience. And I could see that, you know, he acknowledged, like he, he got it. And the day of the funeral afterwards, I didn't want to go out with these guys to have lunch or whatever, but something said, I want that. I just needed to forgive it's the, guy, nine the guy who instigated the gang rape. And I was thinking just this might be the stupidest mistake because I had to make a request of his bodyguard, like, hey, I need to speak to him. Is that okay? Can you, what, mm -hmm. whatever. So we go step outside. I tell him, you know, I acknowledge what happened earlier. You know, I tell him I forgave him. I'm good, all this stuff. And he looked at me for the first time. I felt like, like I was a human being, like on equal playing terms. Um, so Edmonton for me was like, there was so much closure yeah, yeah. and having that experience was so liberating. And that's why I'm so passionate about speaking about forgiveness. Cause I know how many people can hang on to the hurt and the pain. If it's not towards other people, it's the things that they've done. So forgiving oneself, which is even more important because, we live with ourselves and, you know, there's a lot of things that come up from our past where like we get triggered or like, Oh, I remember I did this to that person. And again, it's, it's really heavy. So how can you free yourself from that and not make yourself wrong? 
yeah, no, the self-compassion is, 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 it's huge. So not only forgiving others, but forgiving yourself. Um, yeah. I wanted to, to ask you just very quickly. I know you said that um, as a mother, you can't really say anything because in one ear and out the other, if their daughter is, is entering or getting into the same type of lifestyle, um, pretend then you were talking to your younger self. Would you tell her nothing too? Or would there be something that you could say now just to your 15 year old self? Okay, what would I have said that might have made a difference in that young girl's life? If I was to say something that might have made a difference for her. If anything, if there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing. But I just am curious as to now looking back at your own life. I'm trying to think what the closest thing would be because I know that for me, my experience, there would have been nothing at the time that you could have told me. Um, but if there was something like the closest thing, um, I would probably say something around self-worth, like you are worth so much more and that you that you matter. Like, And why I say that is because, again, this is from my own experience, I've gotten to see how much the story of I don't matter has run my life. You know, like, I don't matter. Like, no one's going to notice if I'm missing from class or if I'm missing from the session or if I show up or if I say something or, so, and I didn't get that till years and years later, you know, of how much I really do matter and how much I'm, I'm worth in this world and how much I have to contribute in this world. Cause I just felt like I'm just a, like a piece like floating with the billions of other people here. So I would say it'd be something around that. Some self-worth. Mattering. I think, and I think a lot of people really need to hear that even if they haven't gone through all that you've gone through. Um, you mentioned that by the time you got to your ex-husband's funeral, you were at a space where you could forgive and forgive, forgive these members and you, you leaned on your spirituality. Where did that come from? Because it didn't seem like it was with you when you were, you know, in your teenage years, but sometime between yeah. his death and that and everything you went through, something changed internally and how that happened. Yeah, it actually came in layers because when I was 17 and the abuse started to get really bad, like when he was locked up and that year in, in 99, I had actually left to San Francisco for a few months and my mom helped me you know, get out of the country and like do it so that no one could see me, you know, leave the apartment. Your mom was always there for you, eh? even when oh, you disappointed her. <laughs> I'm telling you, like, and it's hard to hear her now, like today, today, like today, her, she's going to be 70 this year and her still telling me like, just that was really painful, you know, and I put her through so much. Um, I mean, and, and on another note, we're, we have a great relationship now. So, you know, I went to San Francisco at the time and just before I did, my grandpa had actually passed away two years prior. And th that was her dad. And he came to me in a dream, but I never thought it was really a dream because I was like visiting him and there were, we were walking on clouds. So I was like at his place Okay. and I was like, are you sad that like, do you miss grandma? And, so, and he's like, no, he's like, but he basically, he basically told me, he's like, I know you're going through a rough time and you need to get a, 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 a good um, grasp on reality. Like he tried to like really knock some sense into me. And I remember waking up from that dream. It was a nap I had in the afternoon going like, Oh my goodness. Like something about that dream helped me say, you know what, I got to get out of this. And that's when I went to San Francisco. And then also like with the, I told you the rosary breaking, like, so there were certain things for me, right? Like I grew up Catholic, but then moved away from the church and never wanted to consider myself religious. Um, but then there were certain things that happened along my journey that had me look at things closer. And then it wasn't actually until I was, um, he was locked up and I was in hiding with the kids and I had hired a business coach and I thought, great, he's going to help me grow my business, you know, with all these tactics and strategies, but instead 90% was all mindset. And he gave me not only mindset, but things that were spiritually based. And I wasn't ready actually to this was 2013 or so I wasn't ready to hear the material at the time. Like I remember him um, giving me some book recommendations and I would order the books, but they would just sit there. And then a few years later, I'm like, Oh my gosh, like this all makes sense now. So 
Okay. Yeah. And so it's like, again, like when you're ready for it. Right. So I was ready for it. And then that grew. Um, yeah. And that really helped me. Like, I find that even now, like the quieter that I can, um, be and listen to that inner voice, um, that's always guiding me, you know, in, in the right direction. Right. And maybe that's another thing I would have told my 15 year old self is if I could have been aware of the capacity I had, the ability I had to tune into that inner voice and really get that. It's not just a voice in my head, making up some silly stuff. Like it's actually my voice trying to guide me in the right direction. Um, I would have listened to it more, you know, I would have taken the opportunity to say, how can I hone that skill? How can I really listen to that inner voice? Because that was my heart speaking. That was, you know, for me, I, I say now, like when my heart speaks, it's, it's God speaking for me. And so that's really helped me um, in the last few years, just like, all right, how am I now navigating away from that world into something brand new and into a place of servitude and, and helping other people um, with overcoming adversity and the trauma that they're experiencing? Um, you know, how do I make an impact out there like I'm not out there really like planning stuff. It's just more listening to those whispers. And then the, then we could talk about flip the script in a bit, but like the name will come like flip the script. Okay. Let's run with that. And yeah. then I'll like shelve it. And then another day, like days will pass. And then like, Oh, like this thing came to me. Okay. Like that's another thing. So it it's really in those quiet times that I get the answers. The intuition, right. And those that inner voice. Intuition. Uh, yeah. And then tell us then where are you now like where did that lead you to um, yeah so I did a number of um things first when I got out like I became a raw food chef and personal trainer so I was training women online professional women and then something just said you know I love cooking and or uncooking because it was raw food but I felt like there was something more for me and when I started to share my story and by the way like going through what I went through, I never understood the power of storytelling or sharing my story because I was such a shy, quiet person and private person. So when I was invited to speak at city hall and domestic violence events and so, and women would come up to me and say, Oh my gosh, thank you so much for sharing this. I'm going through this. Or I had a couple of women say their husbands tried to kill them too. And I remember thinking, what is going on here? And then I had men come approach me and tell them tell me about the abuse that they were experiencing with the women in their lives. And I realized that holding back my story would be a disservice, just like anybody else, right? Like we go through our life experiences, same with you, right? Like if you don't share your story, you're actually doing a disservice because there's many lessons that other people can take away from it. So I was like, okay, how can I put that ego aside that's like no just i don't want to be in the spotlight how can i put that aside and, and instead say like okay me sharing is actually helping other people so um i kept sharing um i found you know more and more like of what my voice was um and then only until uh 2019 so it wasn't that long ago um the name flip the script came. Well, actually what happened was I was invited to do a TEDx talk. I did, did the TEDx talk mm. and, you know, I shared my story. I spoke on forgiveness, but here's the thing with that. I actually had a whole other script that was like, like twice as long, whatever. Like I was going to, I was all set to do it. And then the organizer, like two weeks prior, she goes, um, we're going to have to change your story. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I just rehearsed this for months literally months, day in, day out, rehearsed it, memorized it. And she goes, yeah, she's like, but I, she said, I got um, a warning from another speaker because of her story. It was two story heavy. And she said she could get her license revoked. And I remember again, like I was in tears with, with my husband, the new husband at the time. And I said, I don't think I could do this. Like we're two weeks out. What am I supposed to say? I don't know what to say anymore. What am I supposed to change? He's like, well, you could say no. And there was actually something about him saying you could say no, that was empowering. And then I was like, F this. I was just like, I'm going to take this as a challenge. This is, I'm going to, I'm going to find a way around this. So the TEDx talk, I don't know. Did you hear it? 
Um, I the thank you for trying yeah. to do one. Yes, I did. <laughs> okay, so the TEDx talk you heard, only twenty percent of that was the original talk, right? So I changed as much as I could, and. I kept it really short because I only had two weeks to memorize a new whole new basically script. And after that experience, I was like, okay, I'm proud of myself. I got it done despite what happened. And then something said, I think, I feel like there's a bunch of other people that don't aspire to be professional speakers that have powerful stories. And then the name flip the script came. So I thought, let me just like put an event together, Um, found a space. They were willing to host it for free. And it was a winter storm, February, 2019, and 25 people showed up. And at the end of that night, um, I think there were six of us speakers, the whole room wanted to see more. So since then we had um, produced over a dozen events and then um, COVID hit, um, it would, then we did the, like a virtual, the virtual events, but the, the, the whole intention of that was to give people a voice, yes, but it became so much more than that. And Flip the Script is changing your perspective on the narrative that you've told yourself for so long, right? And instead putting on the lens of love and compassion, how can you see your story from the lens of love? How did, what, you know, talk about the gift and the pain. It was a painful experience that I went through, that you went through, that a lot of people go through, but what's the lesson in it? And there's a beautiful lesson in all of our painful experiences if we look, you know, if we really um, have the courage to look. So I wanted these stories to highlight what that gift was in their pain. Um, And then all of the proceeds from those events support our storytelling program for formerly incarcerated men so that they can tell their stories because a lot of them have uh, very deep rooted stories so that they can tell their stories from a new perspective as well. So I've done work inside of um, correctional facilities um, done work outside. Um, we that have help them tell their stories and help them come forward and deal, you know, find the gift and the pain, I guess. Uh, yeah. And then also give them, um, not just that, but like at the end of the program, they have a 10 minute story now. So instead of like their story being yay big, now it's down to 10 minutes. Um, and then they have tools where they can, uh, they learn how to speak confidently from the stage and then, We've also partnered with a theater company. So sometimes there's the opportunity for the guys to take their stories. And then we hire actors to perform those stories on stage. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, Now we've also expanded into New York. Our first event is in a couple of weeks. And we've partnered with an organization there that does beautiful re-entry work in the New York area. Um, So it's really exciting to um, merge with them. So what made you... um feel connected to help ex convicts or people who have been in jail specifically. Yeah. Um, For me, it's like, yeah. Yeah. For me, it's really, you know, again, like you look back at my life. Some people could say like, Oh, that's like, I'm sorry. You had to go through that. I'm like, yeah, don't be sorry. Like I got so much out of it and me being able to, why I want to serve formerly incarcerated men and currently incarcerated is because when I went through the experience of visiting you know, my husband, while he was incarcerated, I was with with somebody who was on the other side of the law. Um, What I got to see was a lot of intelligent, um, some of the most brilliant minds that I've ever seen that were behind bars. And I just see a whole pool of potential that the standard society, the default in society does not see or refuses to see. Um, So I, see it more from the humanitarian side, like at the end of the day, we're human beings, there's no one greater or less than the other person, just because they did something. So what, like a whole bunch of us have done stuff, we just never got caught. So, you know, really, what's the difference? And who are we to judge? So, so for me, it was really important to give a voice to these people who oftentimes don't have a voice, don't get an opportunity to really share their truths. Um, you know, and that's been a really, really beautiful, rewarding experience, you know, to, to give them this platform to have their voices heard. And a lot of people wouldn't give them that chance. So, um, you know, your story kind of shows how you take all the pieces of your life and it helps you to find your purpose. And I mean, a lot of people talk about purpose. Is that something you feel like you're living right now because you're doing this? Totally. Yeah, Yeah. This is definitely part of why I'm here. Um, 
I can't say it's the end all be all. Cause I feel like I don't, I don't feel like there's one main purpose, you know, it's like what the, it's the thing that I'm called to right now, who knows what 10 years is going to look like. Um, what I do know though, is that doing this work with the men I've, this is the first time that I felt so aligned, like this aligned with what I'm doing, you know, cause I, there was never an intention to do this for like attention or like whatever it's, this is really coming from a really, it's so close to my heart. And, you know, it's funny cause I've left correctional facilities dancing in my car. Like I get so much joy out of being with these guys and it, like, yeah. And, and also I feel like over the years, you know, as women, we naturally have friends and spaces to tell and talk, but men haven't had that. And it's not, hasn't been commonplace or really accepted. And so it's great to see more platforms open up and it's a beautiful experience to see men in a safe space, um, really tell, share their stories, um, that they haven't said to other people or like, or they'll just come to me and they'll say, like, I can't believe I'm saying this to you. Like I've never shared this. So I find it's really liberating for them. Um, that's really magical to experience. And that's amazing that you're, you're doing that type of work. And a couple of things you said that I think are very important as well is your passion. You're not so stuck on, okay, this is what I'm going to do forever. This is where my heart leads me now. And if some of my heart leads me somewhere else in the future, then that's fine too. I think a lot of times, and maybe you've seen this as well, people feel so much pressure to try to find their passion, but they just got to go where their heart leads now. And exactly. The heart leads you where you want to go if you can get quiet enough and listen. Exactly. Um, and yeah, know that it can change. And to what, to add to what you said, like some people try to find, find this purpose. And then when they get in it and then say, I don't know, you're doing it for five, 10 years. And then you feel so like contained within that label now that you got to stay with it. And, but it's not really who you are. So for me, it's like, I, and I put that in my book too, like, when you're reading this, I could be doing something different, but this is what I'm doing at the moment, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so yeah. And what is your next event? So just so people know, uh, when, when is the your next, next one event? is April 28th, Wednesday, April 28th, uh, online. The virtual first, yes. Virtual. It's free. Um, usually we have paid events. Um, but because we're marking our first partnership with the New York, um, organization and it's our first expansion into new york it's a special event so anyone that could attend and tune in that would be amazing and it's really exciting because we have i think over 30 people registered so far and it's going to be really cool to see the communities merge and support these three sh uh, story sharers who are all new york based and all formerly incarcerated um, one of them i know he just got out last year he served 24 years i think the other one, I know one of them was 13 years and the other one was around there 15 years or so. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Um, amazing, amazing work. Uh, talk to me about your um, family relationship with your kids and your mother now, uh, your, your parents and your kids. Yeah, my parents are still together. Um, my dad and I, we haven't really had a close relationship. Like he's not the best communicator. Like he'll go through my mom. Um, it's funny when I call, like he'll be like, hey, did you eat supper? <laughs> That's all he says. No, just be a dad. Okay. What can I ask her? Right? <laughs> literally, I'm not, I kid you not. That's all he says. Like, that's his line, his one liner. Did you have supper yet? And then, he'll, <laughs> and then he'll be like, okay, I'm going to call my call. Yes, mom. Dad, let's talk to mom. <laughs> so, um, yeah, my mom and I, we speak every other day, um, or message, you know, text, whatever. Um, and it's great because, you know, like I really, just so appreciate having her as someone who's had my back no matter what, um, without the judgment, like she knows the, like the different guys that I've been through and their histories. And, um, you know, so that's been, I, I just so love and appreciate her. And then my kids now they're this year, they're going to be 15, 17, 19, which is kind of crazy to say. Um, <laughs> So, so look, yeah. you don't look old enough to have a 19 year old. Okay, go ahead. I, yeah, I, I know. Thank <laughs> you. Rock food, I think. 
<laughs> well, not all raw, not raw food anymore, but, um, yeah. but honestly, when people ask and I appreciate, I say it really comes from inside and doing the work, like, you know, so often people want the shortcuts, like, how do I get to, how do I get this? Or how, like, whether it's a beauty hack or like, whatever people want the shortcuts. And it, when it comes to the, like the deep inner work, like when people say like, you're glowing, you're radiant, like when I see you, you would never think you've been through all of this stuff. And I appreciate that. And the same time, like I've put in the work, you know, and I'm still doing the work. And when I say I'm doing the work, like I've had to face like the darkest, darkest, most painful moments, reflecting on it, going through it, forgiving myself, the compassion, everything. The inner inner work. So just so people know what you have to go through. Yeah, exactly. And that inner work is what really is giving me that glow because it like it's a painful experience and hard yeah but I would have rather done that than had some shortcut and try to you know pacify it with like let's just move on and positive thinking like so many people try to put bandages I find on top of their pain and they don't want to address the root cause of it or like where this is really coming from or really like embracing and accepting what happened in the past because it's easy to just avoid it right and shove it under the rug like it's going to go away or like it won't pop up again but somehow it does so um so for me that work is is really important um and uh yeah going back to my kids you know I I I use the term the aftermath of trauma because I, I don't know like in 10 years they could tell me like I remember when this happened or it was because like, you know, I don't, I don't know what kind of impact it's going to have on them. They don't verbalize a lot of things right now. Um, at the same time, you know, there's, you know, there could be acting out attitude. I don't know what's part teenage stuff part, you know, like the oldest one remembers the most because she was the closest to her dad. And then naturally she saw the most, um, you know, she's struggling, um, out of the three of them. I shouldn't say struggling. It's just uh, compared to other three, Um, you know, and I try, I've tried to make their life as normal as possible. And I've always been open with them. Like, I feel like no matter, even though we've gone through so much as a family, I don't want to hide anything from them. So if they ask me, did dad do this? Or what did dad do? Or I've always answered them truthfully because I'd rather they find out from me than someone else or hear it from a bridge of honesty between you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's in the book as well. Like my daughter, I gave her a copy, Um, you know, and the other thing for me uh, is that I've always made it a thing to never talk bad about their father to them. Um, You know, like I'll share even publicly, like the things that I experienced, the abuse and stuff like that and controlling, he was controlling, but I would never say like, he was an asshole or like he did this, like, could you believe that? you know, there's no need for that. Um, you know, and then every birthday that comes along, you know, his birthday, we celebrate it. You know, we, we, I invite them to talk about him as well. Um, so again, as much normalcy as possible. Um, yeah. That's a good message too, for, um, I mean, you see a lot of bitter exes that don't even go through what you went through and, you know, one partner wants to make the other pay forever. And, uh, the one thing that's really coming out at me is the level of forgiveness that you have in your heart, forgiveness and peace. Um, and I love a quote that you you said that joy is your, your only job. Yeah. And, and I, I love that. Thank um, you. Yeah. It's actually going to be book. the name of my book. So originally it was going to be joy is your only job, but someone said, but it doesn't match your story. Like, yeah. like it does, but it doesn't tell you like if it was sitting on a bookshelf, you would never think it's the story of what you actually went through, yeah. you know? So, so tell us about your book then. What is your book called and where can we get it? It's called um, Flip the Script, Dear thank, dear Husband, Thank You for Trying to Kill Me. And I say that because I was thankful that he tried to kill me because I got a lot of beautiful lessons out of that, like forgiveness. Um, I talk about my journey really from, you know, being 15 years old to you know, it was only published in February, 2019. So it's so funny with the pandemic. I'm like, was it 2020? And I'm like, yeah, no, 2020 was, was just a blur. 
<laughs> I know exactly what you mean too. Like, oh yeah, 2019. Yeah, you know, we were a lost year. Was before the <laughs> pandemic. So it could have been February 2020. Um, anyways, it was recent. Uh, so yeah, I talk about the journey and then also, you know, I've shared some things that I've done to overcome. Cause I get a lot of questions of like, what kind of personal development courses that I've been through. And so I share a little bit, um, for me, it, it was important to share my story, but not in a preachy way. Like I always believe that I'm going to share my story and then you take the lessons that you want or whatever resonates with you, but I'm not going to say like, do this, do that. And, um, where people can find it is jessicasantonato.com forward slash the hyphen book. Um, so that would be the best place. And yeah, and then I'm planning to, I'm working on a second book. Um, that won't come out for a while, but that's going to be a partnership between me and um, somebody else who he's actually someone who was incarcerated for 24 years. So he's going to be speaking on resilience as well. Uh, maybe he's someone you want to interview as well you know yeah yeah we'll definitely stay connected i love uh, hearing stories of, of people bouncing back and i always say that like regardless of what we've gone through we can always hear stories from other people and hearing resilience makes us more resilient so just hearing what you've gone through has made me stronger and a lot of people stronger i'm sure in your life and uh, mm. you have many more lives to change you know, regardless what your purpose ends up being uh, yeah. as well um, so <laughs> once again, we can find you at jessicasantonato.com. Uh, mm -hmm. Where else can we find you online and get tickets for your event on the 28th? I'm trying to scale back from social media, but uh, Instagram okay. is still up at jess.santonato. Uh, Santonato is S-A-N-T-O-N-A-T-O. -A -A and then the ticket link is a little bit funny. I don't know if you have links that you can attach to this. Yeah, I'll put it in the show okay. notes. I'll put the links in the show notes. And okay. just because uh, of a curiosity that just brewed inside of me, when you say you're scaling back from social media, is that personal reasons or do you want to share it? Um, it's part personal, but I, I just got tired of social media. Like, especially mm -hmm. Facebook, I deleted it. I was like, uh, and there was the whole the privacy thing. And yeah, yeah. I, there were so many things. Now, but I did keep TikTok alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so for kids kids are listening that they want to hear it so tiktok alive okay and maybe there's a fun level to it it's not so heavy and serious so <laughs> yeah exactly uh, well uh your story is absolutely amazing and i thank you for being on the show and appreciate you having me this evening. <laughs>